Um, so we have a big topic to cover today around contents, programming and comms. And I have to say, we've had uh, lots and lots of interest in today's webinar. Um, before we um, go further, I just wanted to introduce the team today. So my name is Claire Buckley and I work for Julie's Bicycle as program lead. I have an environmental background and I have been working with the arts and culture sector for a very long time, for about 12 years. Um, Katrina, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, Katrina Fallon um, with the Green Arts Initiative in Ireland, which I set up with uh, Theatre Forum as well as Performing Arts Forum, uh, as has been recently rechristened uh, since about 2018. So um, again, extensive background, more originally in the arts and now working in uh, climate and the arts, those two, uh, the interface between those two sections. So looking forward very much to spending time with you today. Um, and we have Brecken uh, in the background from Native Events, who uh, these webinars would not be possible without. Um, and Brecken is supporting us on um, the uh, poll questions and the, um, the feedback at the end of the session. Um, and just to recap, so we've done a whole summer series of training webinars, um, and then we started the autumn series in September. We've uh, today um, focusing on content programming and communications, and then we've just got two more um, before we wrap up the series in, um, in November. If you didn't um, join the previous ses sessions, you can access all of the recordings and the slides at um, the link given here. So what is the focus of today's session? It's a big topic, as I mentioned, um, and what we really want to focus on is what um, arts organizations can do in terms of informing, inspiring and influencing action and behavior change in different ways. And this will depend on the nature of your organization. It might be through programming, it might be through creative work, it might be through the work that you're doing to support artists or to support the sector. Um, and I would really like to state um, that we are certainly not suggesting that you should be programming or doing creative work on climate or environmental themes and the arts council itself it's very clear that it is that's not what it is proposing because of course decisions in this area are entirely a matter for individual organizations but we do know that many arts organizations are already doing this um either through creative work, through programming, through uh, support for artists. And in fact, Katrina and I were just um, reflecting on this yesterday. Um, already in the last couple of years, there has been such um, a, a big change in what's happening in this space. And there is so much more happening already compared with um, a couple of years ago when we first really started working with the Arts Council. So that's great to see. Um, and we're going to uh, provide you with some examples or many examples of the different ways that you can do this. Um, and then we are going to um, focus a little bit in the last bit about environmental communications in terms of what you can do as an organization around communicating your own environmental steps and actions that you are taking. So two um, key topics, what arts organizations can do outside of reducing their environmental impact with some examples and then a few tips and some advice on what to think about in terms of communicating the practical um, actions which you are taking. Um, so I think we know that some organizations are able and willing to take steps to reduce their own impacts, for example, around energy or travel or materials, but other organizations feel that they can do more and have more impact by influencing others through 
their content through the programming, through their sector support activities. Um, so we have that question there for you in terms of where you think your organization can have the biggest positive impact. Another minute or two, we're just over half of responses. Yeah, this might be this might be one where you need to to think about it a bit more. Not such a simple yes no question. Um. Okay, I think we've had about three quarters of you who've answered the question. Um, so we can see um, that actually, interestingly, um, uh, just uh, one response was that the most important thing you can do is to inform, inspire or influence change in action. Three have responded that leading by example is the most uh, the way you can have the biggest positive impact. And actually the majority of you, so three quarters of you say, um, doing both, um, which is um, really interesting to see. And I think a key thing um, that we would definitely look at if you are doing the work around informing and influencing, it's quite um, difficult to be credible if your own good practice, if, you, um, if you're not um, practicing what you preach, so to speak. Um, so a few words um, around the role of the arts and culture. Um, the climate crisis that we are facing now that we are in is a cultural crisis. It's a crisis which is rooted in um, cultural values and norms which are based on individualism, on consumption, on a disconnect from nature. So it is really a cultural crisis. And the arts and culture sector is absolutely crucial to how we respond to this in different ways through its ability to inform, inspire and influence and to act and to lead by example. So I guess it's pretty clear that our answer is that you need, you need to do both. Um, I think one of, one of the key areas where the arts and culture can make a difference is in creating a shift in our values and what we value. So we are in a culture um, in the global north in particular, which is rooted in values of um, individualism. It's about being fast and linear and extractive and consuming more and more. And this shift that we need is towards um, a culture and values of care, collective approaches, regenerative and circular. So it is a real um, change and shift in cultural values. And I think one of the crucial things is this um, idea that we see ourselves as above and apart from nature. And it's something that we can take from without care and that we extract from without consequence. Whereas um, at the heart of where we are now is understanding that we are absolutely a part of nature. We depend on it um, for, for our well-being and to survive and to thrive. And I think um, this is a key area where we're really um, beginning to see the role of the arts and culture in terms of changing and shifting and changing um, that narrative. So we do, of course, talk a lot about the role of the arts and culture and what it can do. I think we are now at a stage also um, of being able to back that up with some evidence as well, because there's a lot of talk it's a hard one to evidence what is, you know, what impact do the arts and culture have in terms of um, behavior change, in terms of influence. But we are starting to build up some evidence in this field. Um, I've just put two examples here um, of work which um, has been funded through the Creative Ireland program um, on <clears throat> the first piece which came out um, 
uh, three years ago, which is um, the role of um, culture and engaging the public on climate change. And the second um, is um, a re evaluation reports on the Creative Climate Action Fund one, which was 15 projects, um, collaborative creative projects, really looking at what um, impact did it actually make. Um, and I also wanted to mention um, a programme called Season for Change, which um, Julie's Bicycle led back in 2020-21, um, together with Arts Admin. And it was a UK-wide cultural programme, <clears throat> excuse me, to inspire um, action on climate change. And it was one of the first programmes where we really built in um, evaluation from the beginning to see, okay, what difference did this make? What impact did it have? What benefits did it bring? And crucially, what difference did it make in terms of the audience and the people who engaged with it? So through the programme, there were 15 um, artist commissions. There was a whole series of online events for artists and organisations to learn and think about their own practice. Um, and there were a total of 230 different events which were submitted to the open program in addition to the 15 commissions. We were able to get information on the audience reach, uh, reached in different ways um, through the actual events and commissions and then more broadly online. Um, and I think one of the, the key the key things where um, we worked together with the audience agency to go a bit more in depth was really looking at to what extent the Season for Change program influenced people's thinking and um, behavior, uh, behavior change. And the key outcome of that was that in particular, well, uh, more generally, that arts programming um, can be a very effective way of engaging and helping people to explore these issues and engaging with people. Um, but what, um, what was particularly valuable were the commissions, which were um, more about getting people engaged directly as opposed to um, more passively. Um, and the information and the evidence there was that and um, that um, more um, interactive focused activities really gave people the time and space to think about their own actions and their own decisions and help to stimulate a behavioral uh, a change in behavior and a change in attitudes. Um, and I think, um, you know, when you're looking at creative work or programming, one of the, the questions is, um, you know, well, actually, it was great. We did that, and you know, what what difference did it make? So, I wanted to share um, that example there, and there's a link to the report which really digs a bit deeper into the difference that that program made. Um, so, uh, Brecken, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. If you can launch that question. So the question really is just to get a sense from those of you here, um, if you have undertaken work in this area. Now I'm just going to try and present my screen here. Hopefully that will work. Yeah, that's good. Could you and I'm not at the right spot. So excuse me while I get to where I'm supposed to be. Apologies. Okay. Um, Brecken, are you able to share the poll results? Yes, should be displaying now for okay. everyone. Great. Okay. So um, actually just under a third of you have said that you are already doing a lot in this area, which is great. And we hope to hear more from you. Um, half of you said you've been doing a little and um, about a fifth of you said you haven't done anything yet, but you are thinking about it. So that's great. Um, and nobody gave a flat out no. Um, so that's good to know you're in the right, you're in the right place. Um, oh, sorry. Are those results shared, Brecken? Yep. 
they were shared by your team. Okay. 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 Um, Thanks a million, Claire. Um, so I suppose that gives you a kind of a, a context. What's unusual maybe about this particular webinar is that a lot of the webinars that are training we've delivered up to now has been very much about a, a practical way that you can reduce your uh, emissions or your environmental impacts as organizations. This is a much uh, more nuanced uh, topic in a way, because obviously, as Claire said, it's really important that we're, we're not trying to force or suggest that this is something that somebody should be doing. Um, but it's an area that's really grown over the last number of years as the cultural sector and the art sector realizes, uh, really start to engage with that whole difficult topic. So. Um, we're just going to look at um, you know, what arts organizations can do, um, areas that they might address. Uh, some of these will resonate with you because, of course, we're really mindful that a lot of you are really active in this area already. So we would be looking basically at things like programming, creative work, performances, exhibitions, supporting members, commissioning new work, which addresses climate action and biodiversity loss, and maybe offering residencies, which address those two themes outreach and education. Festivals will often offer a strand of their program which addresses climate change or biodiversity loss. And there are even are mini festivals which just focus particularly on this topic. And finally, we're going to look a little bit at collaborating or supporting other creative initiatives. And again, just to reiterate this, because it is very important, it's, it's a topic that we know can uh, be a sensitive one for, particularly for artists, because we're not in any sense uh, and I, I suppose, again, this is where this webinar differs from the previous ones. We're, we can't give you any definitive guidance or guidelines on what you should do. This is all really an artistic programming decision for you as organizations and for individual artists. It's not something that you have to do. But at the same time, we're very aware that artists have really begun uh, to reflect the urgency of climate change and what it means for life on the planet. And this is an opportunity to support those artists. And I would have to say visual artists particularly. Uh, they are, that's probably the, the sector within the arts sector um, that have really already been looking at this. And, and the visual arts does kind of lend itself maybe more, um, it's more, it's more engaging sometimes. It's, it's a less challenging uh, way of, of uh, engaging with the public than maybe theatre and other uh, performance art forms. But we would also, I suppose, advise or uh, encourage anybody who is delivering uh, a, a piece of programming, whether it's a, a theatre performance or an exhibition, just to be to try and deliver that uh, the production or performance or exhibition in a way that is also mindful of its impact. So it's not just the content, it's the theme, it's the way in which the creation of the show or the exhibition mirrors the theme. Uh, so there isn't a kind of disconnect between those two things. And so consider that maybe when you're putting together artist briefs for residencies and commissions and so on, and particularly around travel, which is one of the things we tend not to think of. We do tend to think about materials and so on, but we tend to think less about travel. So just maybe um, a word to encourage that in, in any briefs that are being produced. So looking at programming work, just got to, so a lot of what we're going to give you, and there's a lot of content in this webinar, please don't be overwhelmed by it, because essentially what we're doing is we're giving you a whole range of examples. Some of these examples will be relevant to you within your practice or your arts organization, and some of them won't. So just pick what you want. You can go back over this webinar, go back over the slides and decide what might resonate with you. So you could, for example, include, consider including a strand in the program for your theatre or art centre gallery or festival, which addresses climate change and biodiversity loss. So just maybe one or two events. And those could coincide with events or days like celebrations such as Earth Day, National Biodiversity Week, Earth Overshoot Day or the annual COP, the United Nations uh, Conference on Climate Change, which is coming up uh, very shortly. And just to give an example of uh, an exhibition that was held in Bantry earlier this year as part of Biodiversity Week, which happens every May, uh, Seabed, Seabed Sanctuary Collective had a marine art and photo exhibition during that week in Bantry. And a, a bigger example was the Climate Beacons for COP26 uh, back in 2021 that Creative Carbon Scotland uh, organised. And that was a really... Uh, I suppose a really powerful project. It, it they wanted to do something which really tapped into how communities in Scotland felt about hosting the COP conference in that year. And there were seven areas that were represented, kind of beacons. And they didn't set fire to anything. The idea is that these would be beacons of hope and inspiration for communities around Scotland. So one example was the Caithness and East Sutherland Beacon, focusing on climate colonialism, 
land justice and redistribution, as well as the crucial role of the area for peatland restoration. So some of those would really resonate with us here. And each of those beacon areas drew in a number of arts organisations and local community groups. So it was very collaborative. It was very much tapping into what local people felt, but doing it in a creative way. And even the visual idea of these beacons around the country, I think, really resonated with people. Uh, near to home, uh, a really good example. This is, I think, from the, the Dublin Theatre Festival last year. But Lords of Strutt um, produced a piece called Dream Factory, created by Keen Kinsler and Jennifer Jennings, um, composed by GMC Beats. But they, they, yeah, I suppose theatre, I think, is more challenging when you're trying to uh, focus or, or, or produce a work that has a bit of a focus around climate change because it's a really dark topic. And how do you do that with and still encourage an audience to attend? But they used kind of comedy, music a kind of wacky approach. To, many of you would be familiar with the Lords of Strutt and the kind of anarchic approach to how they do things. But they mirrored the actual production in the way that they delivered it. So they were really conscious of using sustainable practices for costumes and props and so on, uh, recycling locally sourced um, props. So um, visual arts, as I say, it's an area that really has been addressing this issue for a long time. The Glucksman Gallery in Cork, which has had quite a number of uh, events and um parts of their program that resonate around climate change. This is an exhibition that continues at the moment until the 3rd of November. It's called Groundwork. And they've selected uh, artworks from the climate, uh, from the UCC art collection, but focused on that theme of climate awareness. Uh, and they also do a lot of work around making those, you know, they're very conscious of how they transport artworks. And uh, so that there is that that double, that, that sort of two strains, I suppose, in terms of what they do. In, in being sustainable. Visual in Carlo, and many of you are familiar with this, probably the leading visual arts um, venue, I would say, that has really been looking at this in a thematic way, while also addressing it in the building, but really a huge amount of content, working with artists, the grounds around visual in Carlo, for any of you who are not familiar with it, they've done absolutely fantastic work there. Um, and this is a project sustainment experiments that began in 2021, uh, Deirdre O'Mahony's uh, project was The Plot. So Deirdre O'Mahony, if many again will know her, she's done a huge amount of work in this area, most recently with um, Field Exchange, one of the creative climate projects. But looking at things like how we grow food in a time of a changing climate. So again, visual arts really lends itself to that whole top topic. Looking more at uh, theatres and art centres, uh, this is Theatre Royal in Waterford, all the world's, world's a climate stage. It's an urban biodiversity garden and was supported by ESB Brighter Futures. Um, so they created this fantastic biodiversity garden outside the building. Um, there's a lot of interesting information about it on their website, but they use that throughout uh, as a whole way of hosting events and workshops and uh, also a creative climate action project, which I'm going to touch on later. So that's a theatre and arts centre that's doing that kind of work also. In terms of supporting mem members, uh, this is an area for resource organisations. Um, will are very active so they're providing members with advice and support on addressing the climate and biodiversity emergency so you can really see we'll give you some examples of that and some of those supports focus on how artists can make their arts practice more environmentally sustainable so that would be looking at materials uh, and things like that and others are looking at kind of thematic approaches and the positive impact they can have and it might simply just be creating a safe space for artists to talk about those themes so they might be able to collaborate or create future artworks focusing on that. Resource organisations can also play a vital role in sharing opportunities for artists, such as residencies, which have climate change focus and so on with their members. And just a couple of examples, uh, CREATE, uh, many of you would be familiar with CREATE, the National Development Agency for Collaborative Arts. And I think they run a networking day uh, every year. It's quite a regular thing. And uh, last year, the focus was on climate justice. And this is something that I suppose in Ireland, I think we're the, in the UK, the thinking is much more advanced on climate justice within the art sector. Here, we're maybe just kind of coming around to it. We're familiar with the idea of the just transition uh, within Ireland, looking at people like Borden and workers and so on, but maybe looking at a more global scale, uh, the role that we have to play um, as a cultural sector in terms of climate justice and that what happens, that what we do here has an impact at the other side of the globe. Um, Digital Artists Ireland, fantastic resource organisation. Again, many of you would be familiar with their work. And they have been doing, also been doing this for a long, long time. They've got a huge amount of really valuable information on their website. But they also run workshops and um, other events to support artists 
to have a more sustainable practice, which is an area that are, a lot of visual artists are very hungry for information on that. I think it's John Thorne from the Glasgow School of Art, Sustainability Coordinator, who's been working with them for this on this for quite some time. Then just uh, maybe a slightly random example of, you know, a diff totally different art form. This is a, a carnival a circus festival in Lublin in Poland. And they were offering, I think this was last year, they were offering um, opportunities for artists who want to you know, address something around climate uh, to do some training with some well-known, a well-known uh, known Norwegian collective called Acting for Climate. So again, it's not just visual arts, it's across a lot of art forms near to home. Um, the Performing Arts Forum, of which the Green Arts Initiative is part. We are running some training uh, starting next week with the wonderful Sinead Wallace from the Lear, and she's doing training on the Theatre Green Book and how to use that. Again, many of you would be familiar with the Theatre Green Book, uh, originating in the UK, but now being applied across Europe. Currently, we're adapting that for the Irish context. And this is aimed at uh, independent production companies, freelance producers, production managers, and so on. And it's supported by CCI Skillnet. So that begins next week, and I think we'll be able to share some information with you on how to sign up for that if it's of interest to you. Moving on now to commissioning new work. And I suppose because the arts have a unique way of speaking to very complex issues, creative approaches, um, you know, art and creative practitioners addressing these climate change and biodiversity issues, we can artists can approach it in a way that's really not available to more traditional approaches. And the whole Creative Climate Action Fund, which has addressed this issue, which is quite un it is unique across Europe, uh, the belief and the faith in the cultural sector and creative people to deliver, to communicate in a way that's engaging. That's uh, something that is, I suppose, it, when art, when organisations are commissioning new, new work, that it's something to bear in mind. Again, entirely up to individual organisations, how that they how they approach that. But again, you know, just to remember not to disconnect entirely from, you know, the, the message isn't, uh, you know, we have to be mindful that we can't just say the art is the most important thing and that how we deliver it is, is of no significance. So just to bear in mind that you try and produce that art in as much as it's possible in an environmentally sustainable way and briefs and commissioning briefs and calls should reflect that. And maybe just one word of caution that uh, artworks and across all art forms, whether the theatre or visual arts, they generally require a longer lead in time where environmental sustainability is applied to production standards. And that's really comes through in the theatre green book for any of you who have tried to apply it. You need time at both ends of creating, um, whether it's an exhibition or a piece of a performance to create and then break down those uh, events at the end. And one example is Kindred, an innovative digital dance installation exploring nature and human connection from Liz Roach and uh, Lightscape. And that was part of Dublin Dance Festival's program for last year. Um, and that was commissioned by the ESB Brighter Future Arts Fund uh, in partnership with Business to Art. So there's an example, I suppose, of a number of organizations coming together, the Dance Festival, um, the production company, the Business to Arts, ESB Brighter Future Arts Awards. And we see that a lot in uh, work that is addressing this topic that it tends to work best when there's quite a bit of collaboration and often collaboration maybe with scientists or community groups or whatever it might be. Uh, looking at residencies, uh, just some general advice, you know, climate change obviously is a very dark topic and the most successful residencies use an approach which is carefully considered, is respectful of communities because there usually is an element of engagement with communities in residencies and which focus on engaging with participants and their concerns. And I just thought this is a very nice example. This is, again, one of the Creative Climate Action Projects, the air we share, and it addresses the issue of air pollution. So you can look at air pollution in terms of how that has a negative impact on our health simply from breathing in polluted air, but also the CO2 that we're missing, emitting into the air is a form of pollution because it's creating climate change. But this is maybe a way of approaching that whole topic at, from a slightly sideways angle, it's very, uh, in, very engaged with that community, a community living in a part of Goa that's a bit disadvantaged and does suffer from air pollution. So, and a, a very good artist brief that's worth looking at for any of you who are considering doing anything similar. Uh, this is a project is a few years old, but this is one that I ran myself in Shim Sathira back in 2019. And we were looking for an artist who would affect the, uh, reflect the challenges of living as a coastal community excuse me, during a time of climate change. And Zoe Fuelon Green was the artist who was appointed for this residency, just a short residency, just for three months. And the objective was really just to reflect that, to engage with people locally 
and to use cultural practice as an interface to communicate an imagined future with a local and international audience. And one of the key parts of that was the final, it culminated on Culture Night, and Zoe worked, working directly onto the walls of the gallery in the building um, to create that final piece. But anybody who was around for Culture Night got to take part in that and contribute to it. So again, it's, you know, addressing that dark topic, but in a slightly playful way, if I can, those two things don't seem to go together, but, you know, it, it can often be um, addressing anything dark. If we can do it with a bit of humour, with a bit of imagination, it can make all the difference. Uh, this is an example um, from the UK, uh, environmental sustainability for international, it's a whole series of tips for artists and cultural practitioners. And I know this took place uh, online in September. Uh, the webinar itself is not yet available, but I think uh, it was Claire who actually highlighted this one. So hopefully the webinar will be available soon and that would be well worth watching because that uh, is delivered by Culture Moves Europe. So it is part of their overall environmental Sustainable sustainability training. So we'll try and share that with you as soon as the webinar is available. In terms of education and outreach, again, just a piece of general advice, let the delivery mirror the spirit of your event and, you know, encourage participants to travel to your outreach and education event in a sustainable way because you're just focusing people's minds on how the practical, um, what the practical impacts might be. Consider timing your events so that it allows for sustainable travel, either by public transport or using active travel. And if you're supplying food and or drink, think about how you, you your approach to any catering, uh, how, the, how that can communicate, how you're prioritizing sustainability. So all those little elements in an event are often, they're often the things that will resonate with an audience. So a few examples again, uh, this is again from the Theatre Royal, this is sort of a continuation of the work they did in creating that biodiversity garden uh, where the wildflowers grow. And this was a lovely piece of theatre created for children Again, as part of one of the um, creative climate action projects, it was one of the smaller spark projects and it began on the stage, moved out onto the uh, to the outside area where the biodiversity garden was and moved down through the streets of the town. So, again, very engaging, very fun, very playful, great way of, of, of bringing children into the whole uh, area without it being a, a frightening, dark topic looking at how outreach and education can work for artists as well. There's the Climate Cafe coming up shortly in the Mermaid Arts Centre in Bray in County Wicklow on the 22nd of November. And that's really for artists. It's a kind of a, a place where they can share knowledge, uh, spark action and see future projects around climate action. It's loose framework allows alternative methods and research models. And this ties in with the project that the Mermaid Arts Centre are running called the Mermaid Garden Project for local residents who maybe don't have a place to grow food um, can learn more about growing food and, and growing plants generally in an urban garden. So again, a way of a, a sort of very gentle way of supporting artists to come together to look at that dark theme. Two events for young people. Uh, one was again back in the Glucksman, drawing on wildlife, using the campus and the grounds of UCC uh, to deliver a, a wildlife talk, but connecting it also with the um, with creativity in terms of it being delivered by an artist, and then. Climate uh, creativity, using stories and art to explore climate justice with young people. That was a, a week long event, a summer school earlier this year, and um, that was delivered by the National Youth Council of Ireland. So those are two approaches which really seek to work with young people uh, in a creative way, addressing that very dark topic. Festivals, just some general advice, I suppose festivals, many of uh, the arts festivals in Ireland tend to have a kind of a generalist approach, you know, with a, a very wide range of activities and art forms. So it's it's a, a, a diverse mixture of ages and interests. So it's a really good opportunity to sort of sneak in uh, an event or a strand in your programme which addresses climate change and biodiversity loss. And, you know, it is possible, believe it or not, to do that with a bit of humour. And an example of that, again, the, the Creative Climate Fund has really uh, generated a lot of really interesting examples. We built this city on rock and coal um, a kind of improvisational theatre piece that engages with people with a different as it moves around the country with different audiences, the actual um, performance is different. So, you know, but using humour to address a dark top, a topic, the fun in fundamental change, as they say it themselves. Uh, Future Limerick is an example of a festival which literally just focused on climate change. It had its first iteration back in 2022 and continued again this year um, with support from the Arts Council and, of course, brought uh, to the public by Sunday's Child Theatre Company in association with the Lime Tree Bell Table, and that took part in various locations across the, the city. 
uh, looking at a whole range of activities, theatre, spoken word, comedy, music, family fun and panel discussion. So hopefully that will continue into 2026. But um, unique enough, uh, we'll touch on one other, but it's unique enough in being a, an arts festival just focusing on that one topic. Here's uh, an example from uh, the Dingle Literary Festival coming up in a couple of weeks time. I'm down, based down here in Dingle and I confess this is my sister, but um, uh, so Emer is, is uh, a writer in residence with the Kerry County Council and she's focusing attention on the, the dramatically expanded um, availability of local transport with a local link service and it's kind of poetry in the bus where poets will, uh, people are invited, it's sold out, people are invited to take a journey on the local link and stop at us with poets who will read out their poetry en route and stop at a certain location, have tea and coffee and back on the bus for more um, more poetry. So, you know, it's fun, but underneath it all, it's drawing attention to the fact that this local link, that this public transport is available and drawing to attention to people to use it more. So I'm going to fly through the last few slides. Uh, Clonmel Junction Festival had a, a reading of a Come Closer, uh, again, a dark comedy piece of theatre by Kira Elizabeth Smith, directed by Paul Mead of Gunanua Theatre. I think that was last year um, in the Galway International Arts Festival earlier this year in July. Is Ar Ireland too late to deal with climate change? So that's an example of a, just a very straightforward, non-creative, non-arts event as part of an arts festival. Uh, with Mary Donnelly, who is the chairperson of the of the Climate Advisory Council. And of course, Go International Arts Festival, probably the festival that's done the most in addressing uh, its impacts. So a huge amount of work has been done by the Galway International Arts Festival over the last number of years. And they've been measuring impacts and they have a dedicated person looking after that. Um, Earth Rising, a visual arts example of what happened in IMA, um, again, focusing on celebrating art and culture as catalysts for environmental change, but also really mindful of how they deliver that programme, building a framework to design and measure impact and ensuring the festival uh, is produced in a responsible, ethical and sustainable way. Apologies now, and the font there is quite small, but just these, again, these are all just a whole series of, of examples which may be or may not be relevant to you. And I'm not going to go through this, but those are some of the examples of the environmental measures that they took to make that um, uh, Earth Rising Festival more environment, environmentally sustainable. Finding a look at collaboration and um, increasingly we're seeing collaboration in any creative project that deals with climate change because it tends to have the best engagement, I suppose. And this was, of course, with the Creative um, Climate Action Fund, the focus of those um, projects, if you were going to apply for funding, was really looking at how you engage, no, it wasn't your, the applications that prioritised collaboration were the ones that succeeded because they had the greatest potential to make a difference. And this is Four Seasons in a Garden, in our garden, a yearbook, celebrating biodiversity, addressing climate change and fostering intergenerational connections in Sligo Town. So it linked uh, the Kids Own Publishing Company with Cranmore Cooperative Society, uh, which was a kind of local development group and a panel of scientists and experts. So a real... Um, mishmash, if you like, but a real bringing together of, of a whole lot of different influences that could make that project successful. And the final example I'm going to give is um, from Scotland. Again, this is a, a project that Creative Carbon Scotland ran with Perth Theatre Concert Hall, um, an artist in residence project over 12 months, looking at transforming audience travel through art and focusing on the audience that travelled to Perth Theatre Concert Hall. Um, uh, Helen McRory was the artist, but a lot of fun again. You know, there was a flash mob with a local choir on a bus um, and there was lots of other workshops and events that took part, uh, that were part of that overall. So have a look at that. We'll be including that in the resources when we share the information uh, after this webinar. And I think I'm going to be handing back to Claire now. And I think we're going to, we have one more Zoom poll that I think Brecken is going to launch there. Yeah. So which of any of the following are you already doing on environmental communication? Because Claire is going to look now at that whole topic of, you know, how you communicate your practice and how you communicate uh, what you're doing within your organization, those kind of practical pieces. Uh, so over to you, Claire. We have a few answers coming in. And Claire, you're still on mute. Perfect. Classic. Thank you. I've also just got the sun blinding in now, which makes a change. Um, 
Okay, we will just give it another few seconds. We've got. So you're just going to say if you have any examples that you want to share, if you've clicked other in that poll, feel free to share those in the chat. Um, because obviously the, the more examples that we can share with each other, uh, the better for everybody. Okay, so we've got about three quarters of you there. Um, uh, so we've got over half of you who are sharing your environmental commitment to good practice on your website. And uh, then just under half who are communicating good practice at your performances or festivals or sites. And then about two fifths of providing information on environmental measures um, in your buildings or at your festival sites. And then a quarter who already are doing some campaigns on specific topics, environmental topics. Um, and then eight of you who have also selected other. Um, it would be fantastic um, if you could um, put in the chat um, the examples of the other kinds of things that you are doing. That would be great. <clears throat> Um, before we um, actually go on to the comms piece, I just wanted, we just wanted to share a couple of examples with you of how different organizations have actually addressed their commitments around programming and creative work, et cetera, in um, their strategic goals or in um, specific environmental policy statements. We just have two quick examples here. Um, and this one is from Baboro, um, the International Arts Festival for Children. Um, and they have um, within their strategic goals, one is focused on the environment um, and the way that they put it is um, that they are reflecting the environmental and biodiversity will reflect the biodiversity and environmental crisis in the way they work and in the stories they tell. Um, and I think um, in particular, just to flag here, you know, again, it's combining both the good practice and the creative and programming work, in particular creative programs that reflect children's curiosity and passion for the world around them. Um, so they've started um, with strategic goals um, and then a commitment to um, um, through their environmental sustainability policy. Um, and I'm not sure, perhaps we have someone from uh, Babaro, um here today at this session. Um, and another example um, that we wanted to share, which um, gives um, a very nice, um, yeah, a very nice um, example of how to do it is from the LEAR, the National Academy of Dramatic Arts. And within um, their four um, key areas within their sustainability policy and plan, um, they have included education and community engagement, and then a range of priorities in the way that they will do this. For example, raising awareness among students and staff um, and um, encouraging sustainable theatre production beyond the Lear Academy. So I think there is that kind of very clear approach to um, uh, using their influence um, to um, have a, a wider impact beyond their own actions, but also having their own good practice. Um, and actually, sorry, also very briefly, just to mention a couple of upcoming initiatives um, from Youth Theatre Ireland, um, the um, Youth Theatre Practice Symposium, which um, is focused on um, environmental sustainability and climate action, which is coming up um, on the 8th and 9th of November. Um, and you can see the topics there, um, a range of different topics. And the other um, thing which we also wanted to share was um, from the Roots for Future um, Collective, um, which is a climate arts assembly um, and they're um, holding 
um, a, get, a gathering um, on the 12th of December um, and they're aiming to build up a climate art assembly. And that's one uh, thing we wanted to share with you, which might also be of interest um, to the artists um, with whom you are working. Um, so we hope that we have covered um, <laughs> Uh, examples which speak to your organization and what you do. We wanted to spend the last few minutes just looking at environmental communications in terms of communicating what you are doing as an organization. And we've seen um, from the poll, the last poll, um, that you are all already um, taking action in this area. Um, a couple of key things we wanted to say was, first of all, to share and celebrate what you're doing. Um, I think we know that actually there are a lot of organizations who are doing really great stuff who don't um, actually share it. Um, and um, I think, you know, being able to have that information and share what you are doing um, can help to give others an example and to inspire others and also your audiences or your members or the artists you're working with. And um, so more, more sharing and more celebration. There's lots of great stuff going on. Um, the second key thing um, is about knowing your audience, um, audience in inverted commas. So who do you want to reach? what matters to them and how, what is the best way to reach them. Um, but I think within this um, area, we would also say, um, do also think in your communications and you, who you want to reach, think about how to be inclusive and how to go beyond the usual suspects and particular reach underrepresented people and groups. And the third key thing um, in terms of communications um, that we wanted to say was to be positive. Um, I should add from uh, Katrina's presentation, if you know, bring in a bit of fun or humor um, where that's appropriate, um, be solutions oriented and mind your language. We have lots of different terms which are used, green, eco, environmental responsibility, climate action, um, and I think there is something really important about um, being clear and consistent um, on the language that you use. Um, so a couple of examples here um, from some of the um, some arts organizations who are already making information available on their websites from uh, the pavilion in Dunleary to Dunamish Arts Center. We've mentioned the Theatre Royal already, um, and they provide different type of information on the website, both in terms of practical action and um, their programming and creative and outreach work. Excuse me, oops. Oh. Um, <laughs> then um, other examples, also Katrina mentioned the Galway International Arts Festival, um, which has some great information on the website and West Cork Music, um, in terms of a resource organization, Performing Arts Forum has a wide range of information. They have a green arts section on the website um, with um, news and links and upcoming events and sharing the results of different um, pilot projects as well. Um, and a final um, example here in terms of communications. Um, this is um, a short film called The Last Harvest, um, which um, was supported by Clare County Council Arts Office and Creative Ireland. Um, and the theme of the short film was around um, climate change and the impact on uh, food and farming. But they also took the opportunity to develop this really as a best uh, as a pilot project in sustainable short filmmaking. They've shared what they've done. They have made a short video to share what they did, um, and they also shared um, they uh, commissioned a carbon footprint report. So I think that you know it's a really lovely example of how. Um, both that influence and um, awareness raising and good practice leading by example have gone hand in hand and how they have 
shared their and are sharing their experience with other organizations and artists. Um, so a couple of words about knowing um, your audience and who you want to reach, what matters to them and how best to reach them. There's been some great research done um, in Ireland through uh, climate change in the Irish Mind program, which clearly shows that awareness is not the issue. People are aware. They want the government to do more and um, a, about half um, of the people involved in that very wide ranging um, research said that they were planning on doing more themselves. And I think what, what was really one of the really interesting things um, in that research was that people accept the science and the need to take action. There's hardly any climate denialism within, that, within the population. Um, and two other points I wanted to highlight here is that there is a strong belief that climate action will lead to an improved quality of life. Um, cleaner air, better transport, um, more connection to nature, more community connection, that more um, different um, green jobs or green skills. Um, I think that's that's something which is really interesting to bear in mind um, in terms of communication. And the fourth point that I wanted to flag there was that um, just transition and perceptions of fairness and equity in the way that we respond are considered very important, that we need action and solutions, which works for everybody and which, for example, is not only available to uh, those who can afford um, more expensive organic food or um, electric vehicles, for example. Um, one one other uh, point um, which has come out of research done in 2021, um, this point about change being a process and not an outcome, just to, to highlight that um, the decisions which people make and um, um, behaviour change mm -hmm. are partly informed by an understanding of the facts, but are also very much influenced by their underlying values, personal values and social and cultural norms, which is again, um, something um, really important to bear in mind in terms of communications. Um, I just uh, summarized here some findings from a survey which was done in the UK with 112 cultural organizations um, who then went out to their audiences. So it had um, over 17,000 audience responses. This is the third um, time this survey has uh, been done and has been looking at expectation, audience expectations and attitudes um, and showed that cultural audiences and visitors were likely to be more concerned about the climate emergency um, and while there is a minority which think that um, cultural organizations should, as, it, as it's put here, just stick to putting on shows, the majority of audiences want and expect organizations to communicate what they're doing and to tell their audiences, their visitors, what they can do and how they can help. Um, so there's some uh, really uh, useful um, insights in the Act Green survey and um, as I said, this is the third time that survey has been done. And um, a final few points um, in terms of communications and your audiences, um, thinking about who you want to reach and what's likely to be of most interest to them. This is um, an example here of the different types of information. So information or communication about your practical actions, um, information about environmentally um, themed programming or creative work, general information um, around your environmental policy and progress, and then um, other information about um, things such as awards, certifications, or bigger projects. Um, and this uh, is just an example in terms of thinking who you want to reach and what are the different types of information and communications which are likely to be of more interest to them.
Um, <clears throat> so the final um, point um, that we just wanted to make were in terms of communications is around being positive, being solutions oriented and being careful of the language which you use. Um, we were involved in a piece of research which was looking at the role of music events, live music events on audience travel choices. Um, and I think the, the conclusions of that research actually are something which are um, more generally applicable, in particular in terms of um, in, in communications focusing on collective and um, collective action, what we can do and what we can achieve together in finding the stories that show the change and not only focusing on facts and figures, um, in uh, focusing on fairness and feasibility, what are um, the actions which will work for everyone. Um, and then the last point there in terms of um, the, the reach and credibility of um, events, cultural events, um, and how they can spark those conversations. So a few key pointers in there, which I think really um, can apply to um, cultural uh, programming and creative work and engagement more generally. Um, in terms of being positive, uh, just some nice examples here um, in terms of different messaging. So this example here is about um, waste and littering and um, actually through the research showed that this sign increased littering, um, whereas the positive messaging telling people what to do, and what, is, what is expected and um, had um, a, a much more a positive impact in actually reducing littering. So just some examples of being positive. And the last um, point, just to summarize a few do's and don'ts in terms of environmental comms, is telling stories that speak to the values and interests of those you want to reach and being careful and trying to avoid using technical languages or big abstract concepts and terms, using facts, data and figures where relevant and putting them into context as opposed to just bombarding people with data and figures without the context. Be honest, transparent, precise, and specific, and avoid using greenwash, talking vaguely, um, and you know, using terms that aren't clear or um, that are de deliberately vague. Um, frame sustainability as something that you're working towards as opposed to saying oh okay all of a sudden we are green now um explain why something matters to you and your organization as opposed to assuming that people will just get it use the positive framing and be solutions focused as i've mentioned previously as opposed to giving people all, only the negative stories with no call to action and, and negative messaging and the final point is finding opportunities to link your environmental actions, practical actions and initiatives to your creative program. So that was a, a, a whiz through um, the topic, uh, a whole, as we said at the beginning, very, very big topics. I hope that you have found some content and examples and ideas in there which are helpful um, we are just coming to the end of the session. Apologies, we have run slightly over time. Just to recap that the next um, session coming up is on Energy for Festivals on the 5th of November, so next Tuesday. Um, and if we could ask you now to um, recommend